for Wendy to have acted multiple on multiple occasions, including the time she left, in a very long-term, very secretive planning mode, and then a very almost shockingly sudden execution. It just makes me wonder. Brian from Madness and Motive. Today, I want to review the police interview with Tamara Demko, who was a mutual friend of Dan Markell and Wendy Adelson. Tamara is a graduate of Harvard Law School and an attorney herself. She's incredibly intelligent and intuitive, and her interview provides some behind-the-scenes insight, particularly about Wendy. Stick around to the end where she shares something about Wendy that I found very eerie and unsettling. Rather than play the entire interview, which you can watch elsewhere, this video will serve as a companion piece that you can watch either before or after the full interview. I've grouped Tamara's statements into themes, which will allow us to have a more organized discussion about the information she shared. I also created a transcript of the entire interview, which includes a section at the bottom for each theme and includes relevant statements for each one, and that's linked in the description below. I want to credit the Deep Dive True Crime YouTube channel for the original video of the full interview. That is also linked in the description below. I encourage you to visit, watch the whole thing, and while you're there, be sure to subscribe to that channel. So without further delay, let's get into it. The first theme I want to focus on is the conflict between Dan and Wendy, which Georgia Kappelman called particularly venomous. Of course, Wendy downplayed the intensity of this conflict and tried to distance herself as a participant, but Tamara shares three insights into the battle between the two parties that help us better understand the depth and complexity of it. Let's listen to the first clip. Recently, they kept changing attorneys over and over and over again. And I'll at some point pull up a list because we had a conversation that it's still on my Facebook messages about attorneys because I was looking for one. I have since worked things out with my ex, but just verbally. But at the time I was looking for one, so he was telling me who was good and who he had, but they were constantly switching. So he was blocking the attorneys that she had. She was blocking the attorneys that he had because there was some conflict of interest. And it was just, it was spiraling to the point where it was like, was there anyone they could represent either of them in town? Here, Tamara explains that both Dan and Wendy were working with different family attorneys in Tallahassee. And the problem is if, for example, Wendy works with an attorney, that attorney can now not work with Dan because there's a conflict there. As they continue to consult with more family attorneys in the area, it became more and more difficult and inconvenient to find one locally. So this shows just how strategic the maneuvering was uh, between the two parties. And it also directly conflicts with Wendy's statements that things weren't that nasty and she wasn't just as much a participant in this whole thing. In this next clip, Tamara's going to explain the situation around the financial disclosures that were part of the divorce proceedings between Dan and Wendy. And then I want to share one additional quote from her that you might not be aware of where it was blowing up he he somehow found out that she withheld financial disclosure yes and was going to use that yes for what purpose it was to discredit her and have things adjusted i believe including getting back his heirloom okay he told you this yes okay and he he told you the figure of Half Danny, a million dollars is what Danny he said. told you that directly? Yes. So in other words, when they were going through their, their divorce proceedings and they each had to file disclosure statements, Correct. she shorted it by, by half a million. He said she fraudulently did it, yes. Tamara believed that Wendy said this was inheritance money. So it's not just Wendy's money, this is family money. For me, that really notches up the intensity of this particular battle and really the conflict overall and is yet another indicator that this whole thing between the two parties involved the entire Adelson family. Next, let's look at something Tamara shares about Amy, who was Dan's girlfriend after he divorced Wendy. He had recently gone to visit her, 
So after we went to dinner, he was leaving to go visit her. And he, they, they had this pattern where they switch off every couple of weeks. Um, mostly she, he would fly up because she had some flying issues and was a little bit timid about flying. So he would go up um, and she was scheduled to come down and meet the boys in person for the first time, which recently just happened. So he was all excited about that. And she had started Skyping with the boys. My understanding was that Wendy had found out that she was Skyping with the boys and was furious about it. Tamara tells about an incident where Amy was Skyping with the boys and Wendy became furious. She goes on to share a little bit more detail. And overall, you can see she's painting a picture that Wendy is not handling Amy's involvement with the boys very well. Not that it's difficult to prove motive for an ex-wife in a murder plot because of all the emotion and money swirling around, but these statements from Tamara are very useful, and in my opinion, it shows that a prosecution team would have plenty of material for setting the stage in a trial for Wendy's involvement. Next, I want to share some statements from Tamara that show, in my opinion, how Wendy demonized Dan and looked to gain allies for a variety of purposes. One of the many allies Wendy looked to gain was Tamara herself. Let's listen to a short quote from Tamara's interview. I didn't know what to think about what she'd said, that he was kind of being psychologically abusive. This tactic of making Dan out to be the bad guy and making herself out to be the victim is something Wendy will do with a number of people to gain them as allies. Wendy, of course, did this with her own family, but also Dan's colleagues and close friends, as you just heard. At the beginning, and then over time, he felt like he wasn't anymore. And I think the same thing. He felt like he was fine with her parents, and then all of a sudden, they flipped on him. He was very confused about it. And I think over time when he was hearing some of the things that she had passed along to colleagues who then started looking at him funny, she, he realized that his, her family members may be thinking the same things. From these comments, it almost sounds like Wendy was methodically working through all the people in her life and also Dan's life. Things are going well with Charlie and Wendy's parents, and then all of a sudden they weren't and it was really confusing to Dan. Then he, Dan starts getting funny looks from his own colleagues. I think in some cases, Wendy just wants people on her side. I think in other cases, she wants people to take action, like in the case of her family. It's the opinion of myself and many others that Wendy used her position as the victim and the youngest of the family, and their protective instincts and over-involvement in her life to goad them into action. I don't think she knew exactly what her family would end up deciding or doing, but I do think it's her MO to demonize, play the victim, gain an ally, and then use that ally for some purpose. And speaking of purpose, we have good old Jeff Lacasse. Uh, he's an awesome and helpful witness so I hate to put him on this slide, but he was made an ally in my opinion. She talked a lot about the divorce and Jeff even shared in his police interview that he did not like Dan and I think he said he wanted to you know, kick his butt um, at one point. Now, Wendy's purpose for doing this may have been her reflexive need to get people on her side, but in my opinion, as the date of the murder approached, got closer, it sort of dawned on her that he could be useful in this whole thing. He's on her side and he's made statements about disliking Dan. And Jeff said himself that he wasn't surprised that he would be a suspect. Another one of Wendy's allies is a woman named Jane. Now, Tamara calls her Janine in her statements. So just be ready for that. Let's listen to what Tamara has to say about Jane slash Janine. Janine was with Wendy when she found that one. They, Janine's like, I went to the police station with her, but it felt very, I was like, is she an attorney? Is she representing her? It just, it felt very guarded, very, very guarded. Like, like you have like her personal bodyguard now and, and almost like guarded with the children around me. And I'm like, that's really weird. Jane is an interesting character in all of this. Tamara was a good friend of Wendy at the time and didn't know about Jane and found her presence at this time around Dan's murder to be really odd. Jane is a guard of Wendy. She's an advocate for her. 
And in Wendy's only police interview, she's someone that kind of helps implicate Jeff Lacasse, who is actually a friend of Jane. Nice. We'll talk more about Jane later on in the video, but in my opinion, Wendy demonizes and plays the victim in order to gain allies that can be used for different purposes like guarding, advocating, or in the case of Jeff Lacasse, even sacrificing. The next theme is one I'm calling The Mask, and let's start off with a quote about covert narcissists. They can't get what they want if the world knows who they really are. And now a quote from Tamara. Over time, I think Danny was able to tell people in a way that they started seeing she was acting inconsistent. And so I think she felt that. In my opinion, Wendy was able to fake it for a while with Dan, but over time, during their marriage and during their divorce, Dan was able to see the real Wendy. And when someone who wears a mask is exposed and another person can see them, it's a very bad situation. It's one of the worst things that can happen in their mind, and it causes them to behave in really extreme ways, which we'll see. He really wanted them to be raised Orthodox, and this was a huge bone contention between the two of them. They agreed on it when they got married, and then over time, she made it fairly clear that she was not into that. So for the first year after the kids were born, first year or two, they did the ritual, they sang songs, they were teaching them the songs, everything seemed good. And then she just didn't want to go to temple with him and sort of declined. Here, Tamara's explaining that Dan and Wendy got married, everything seemed good, she was doing the ritual, they were singing the kids' songs, teaching them songs, she was a full participant, everything seemed good, and then all of a sudden, it just didn't. Now, I do think this is a case where Wendy used a mask to make Dan believe she was someone she's not, but I think there's a little more to this. Let's read a quote from an article in the Miami Herald. Quote, Donna, according to numerous media reports, would help pick her husband, Markel, through a Jewish dating site. So this, in my opinion, is yet another ingredient to the volatile, toxic cocktail that is Wendy Adelson her own mother, Donna, and the pressure and expectation and, like I said earlier, hyper-involvement that Donna had in her life. She helped Wendy choose her husband uh, through that dating site that she was using. So it's not entirely Wendy's decision on her own, and it ultimately ends up turning to disaster. Just look how far Wendy took it. She had doubts even before the marriage, but she goes through with the marriage, she plays along for years, has two kids, pressure builds because she's not living authentically, and finally, the whole thing just explodes. Wendy's mask doesn't just hurt and deceive others, I think it does the exact same thing to her. I also believe that she avoids confrontation when things do explode, and I think this is really important, and we'll get into more of that later in the video. Now, let's listen to Tamara comment on Wendy's relationship with Jeff Lacasse. Not because that felt weird to me. Right. Um, but she's referring to she's the social referring worker? She's to the social worker boyfriend. Do you know his name? She, they were Facebook friends. I don't know if they still are. She had his picture up. They've been dating since September, she told me. Um, Dan knew about him. He mentioned him to me when we went to dinner the week before, or a couple weeks before. Um, and... His take was kind of like, well, she's happy, boys, and she just, you know, getting on with her life. He apparently went poof shortly thereafter. Tamara actually said that he went poof shortly thereafter, but I guess the captioning is still pretty accurate there. Here we have Wendy dating Professor Jeff Lacasse. It starts in September. She is, by all accounts, really excited about it. She even had his picture up on Facebook, which was a small detail that I didn't know. Tamara, again, Wendy's friend, didn't even know about Jeff Lacasse until much later. She shares that she had to learn it through Dan. And you can see from her phrase, he apparently went poof shortly thereafter, that this ended really suddenly and unexpectedly and in a confusing way. It just didn't fit it didn't make sense. It's at least possible this started as an earnest attempt to find a partner, but many believe at some point 
Jeff LaCasse became a tool for Wendy to use, and he even said that himself, letting Donna heavily influence her marriage partner choice and letting it go so far as to marry the man and have two kids with him when she knew before the marriage she was having doubts. Dating Jeff LaCasse for months and then dropping him just like that. Remember, he was close with her kids. Tamara's insights help us see that Wendy hides her true self and her true desires behind a sophisticated mask, and it causes people great confusion and results in extreme behavior when she can't or won't fake it anymore. Women are said to possess a superior intuition. Women's intuition is an almost psychic and somewhat frightening knack for knowing what others are feeling and thinking. Experts say this intuition is based on an ability to read facial expressions and body language. As I said at the beginning, Tamara is incredibly intuitive. I actually ran the numbers on this, and almost 50% of the words that Tamara spoke during this interview were focused on this theme of intuition. Let's look at one of the most interesting quotes from this section. I got upset for the first hour. I called John Beeman and said, what the hell happened? He couldn't tell me much, but there was a suggestion that maybe it was a known entity. As I said, before we even got to him saying that, I was thinking about the relationship with Wendy, and it just didn't feel good. This really struck me because are there others who might point to Wendy and provide additional information? I think law enforcement might have a lot more information on Wendy than we realize. Let's listen to some statements from Tamara on the day of the murder. So... There are different people, but I, I didn't even want to call her. I also found it strange that she didn't call me. She knew how close I was to him. She, I just guess left her for her. She and I are friends. She didn't reach out to me, contact me, anything. I didn't even want to look at her Facebook page or call her. I'm like, she didn't reach out. This is just weird. And that's why I just showed up. Oh, you talking about today? Yesterday. Yesterday? Oh, at the house. Mm-hmm. Then you showed up unannounced. Correct. Yeah. So when you, she's saying I'm sorry when you, when you when she greeted you, you're associating that with I'm sorry I didn't call you. I'm sorry I didn't notify you. No, she that was an I'm sorry for your loss because oh. she knew how close I was to him. No, I found it strange that in the period where she learned something had happened to him, and didn't know he had died because apparently she didn't that hadn't happened yet. She didn't call me. Nothing. She knows I'm his oldest and closest friend here. Didn't call, nothing. Like, it just, that just didn't feel right either. So the day of the murder, Tamara finds out that Dan has been shot. And in some part of her mind, she's expecting Wendy to call. The call never comes. Tamara is good friends with Wendy. She's guest lectured for her on numerous occasions. And Wendy knows that Tamara and Dan are old friends. She doesn't receive a call. Her intuition is screaming, and so she's had it. She gets in the car and shows up to the Adelson house unannounced. I think this is a pretty compelling piece of information because if we think back to the closing statements from Charlie's trial, Georgia talks about what Wendy didn't do on the day of the murder when she drove right up to the crime scene. She sees tape and emergency vehicles and personnel close to or at one of the houses her kids are living at, and she doesn't call the school or Dan. She heads to the liquor store and then goes to lunch with her friends. I think this instance is, of course, weaker than that, but it's yet another example of odd behavior and something she didn't do, something that is atypical and what people who knew her and were even friends with her wouldn't expect. Present. Um... When I walked into Wendy's yesterday, and I'm assessing the situation, and Janine was there, and they were trying to, they like went into a private conversation, and I'm sitting down, and I'm like, well, da 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 da, -da does you know, does Amy, you know, we'd have to tell, talk to Amy, and da da, -da. and I said, I talked to Amy, and I said, does she know? They said, yeah, she knows. And they're like, no, not what happened. Does she know? as if, does she know where the investigators are looking, was the implication. And I said, what do you mean? And the next question was, Wendy redirected and she said, has she talked to her husband? And so she started down this path with Janine there of 
making me wonder or making or wanting to make me wonder if Amy's husband was involved. It, it didn't, I still didn't feel led that way, even with that discussion change. But that was the path. Earlier, we learned Jane was an ally of Wendy's. And once again, we see the purpose of it coming through, at least in my opinion. In Wendy's police interview, which I may do a future video on, you can see that she sort of encourages Jane to bring Jeff up as a suspect. And here we have Wendy at home. Jane's there talking to her. Tamara kind of joins the conversation and they try to, according to Tamara, lead her down the path of thinking that Amy's husband might be a suspect. Once again, in Wendy's police interview, uh, she also mentioned Amy's husband as a potential suspect. For a lot of people, when they watch Wendy's police interview or testimony, something just doesn't feel right. They don't feel the right kind of emotion from her. They don't even feel the right kind of sympathy or empathy coming from themselves. And while that could just be bias because of a lot of the information that's out there, here we have a friend of Wendy's who feels something is off about this whole conversation and this whole situation and sees right through the attempt to lead her down a path. I don't think that any one of them physically pulled the trigger. I think it is extremely odd that Janine all of a sudden is tagging on. I found it extremely odd that Wendy's boyfriend that she was so excited about a few weeks ago was not there. When I was leaving, I said, well, where's your new guy? Shouldn't he be here to come for you? And she's like, there's no new guy. And I was like, that's interesting timing. Here we have Tamara starting to express her feelings about the odd timings of things. She says this Jane lady is suddenly tagging on. This new boyfriend that she was so excited about is gone. There's a lot of interesting timings that don't feel right here. She goes on to tell about something big, some bomb that Dan was about to drop on Wendy. I think this could have had to do with the financial disclosures and the potential inheritance money that we discussed earlier. Tamara once again concludes here that the timing of it all doesn't sit well with me. This intuitive information that's being shared may seem like nothing to you when you think about what's going to be spoken of in court. However, I will refer back to Sarah Dugan during opening statements at Charlie's trial where she said to the jury, you'll have to decide what is coincidence and what is not. So I think it's entirely possible that statements like these could be used to create context or support evidence. You worried for your own safety? I was worried like if someone is so rational that they would do something like this or put out a hit or plan this or whatever like this or put out a hit or plan this or whatever like this or put out a hit or plan this or whatever and they feel like someone is really suspicious about it that that person why not this really speaks to the level of unease Tamara felt about the Adelson family at the time of the murder the next theme is called close to the vest these comments might shed light on Wendy's behaviors and what she's capable of doing and known to do. Let's listen. Wendy is, is good at keeping things close to the vest and redirecting. And for example, she and I were pretty close while she was writing that book. She didn't tell me she was writing the book at all. Here, Wendy's written an entire book and never even told a supposed friend, which of course Tamara finds surprising and very odd. A book is something that takes a really long time to write and is likely something Wendy was very excited about. And this shows that Wendy, despite what Jeffrey Lacasse said about her blurting out information, she is very capable of holding things close to the vest, as Tamara said. So after that, and she, I, I talked to her and she told me that she was dating someone and I said, oh, and I thought it was new. It wasn't new. She'd been dating this guy since September. Tamara goes on to say, I didn't know she was dating anyone. I mean, I heard from Danny, but then I didn't know from her. And I think he knew from other people telling him. So that was kind of odd. Remember, Tamara's not just a mere acquaintance to Wendy. They're friends, and she's done some guest lecturing for her. There's a solidified relationship there, and Tamara doesn't find out about Jeff until many months after. She actually finds out from Danny, but it sounds like she had a conversation with Wendy where she got the information out of her. 
This capability Wendy has of holding things close to the vest pairs with the next theme of long-term planning. Listen to this quote from Tamara. So he had to refurnish, and he's like, I spent $10,000 refurnishing this place. If you're not familiar, when Wendy was ready to divorce Dan, she waited for him to leave town. She put divorce papers on the bed, and then she took the kids and some belongings from the house and just left. He came home to a half-empty house and divorce papers. Now, what I didn't realize before, and maybe you didn't either, is that she took a lot of furniture. So it's not like she had the kids in one arm and scooped up everything she could hold in the other and then ran out of the house. No team, this bee got a U-Haul. This is, in my opinion, Wendy's MO. Mask up, fake it, pressure builds, and then the explosion. And she avoids confrontation here as well. She prefers to snipe you. This is eerie to me because it so closely mirrors Dan's murder we get to the breaking point, a plan is made, his schedule is studied, and then he's blindsided. Let's listen to more from Tamara about long-term planning. You wrote this book, it's gonna come out this fall. Or... No, it came out. Okay. I, I don't remember when it came out. I can probably go through notes and figure out. But the timeline for when she left him, she had published it many months before she left, and that's how she put it in the book. Okay. So she had been planning it for a long time. Because there was no acknowledgement of him as her no husband. Of him. Even though they were still married Correct. at the time. Okay. 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 And they were still living together at that Correct. time? Okay. Yep. And she told me later that, you know, she had been thinking about it for a long time, but she had really been thinking about it for a long time. Like it was a deftly executed plan of he's gone this weekend, everything out. Tamara is referring to something that she saw in Wendy's book that really troubled her. It's a note that says the author lives in Tallahassee with her two sons. So she left Dan out of this note. Obviously, she finds this disturbing because of how long a book takes to write and when that note would have had to have been added. At the time, they were supposedly happily married. They're living in the same house. And yet Wendy leaves him out of the story when she puts this note in the book. For Wendy to have acted multiple on multiple occasions, including the time she left, in a very long-term, very secretive planning mode, and then a very almost shockingly sudden execution, it just makes me wonder. Tamara clearly sees something off about Wendy when she's thinking back on things like this. Remember, Wendy is supposed to be some doughy-eyed, social butterfly, super friendly and bubbly, but here we're seeing behind the mask, in my opinion. Planning, secrecy, timing, and execution. Hides things from them, doesn't have the proper back-and-forth conversations in person, and then snipes them when they least expect it. Tamara does mention that she witnessed this type of thing from Wendy, this planning and execution on, quote, multiple occasions. It's possible she was referencing things she already spoke about in the police interview, but just in case, I would have liked to see this explored more. Are there other instances of this type of behavior that Tamara could share with us? Tamara Demko is awesome. She's a great friend to Dan who shared relevant information and was honest about what her intuition was telling her. Here are my takeaways from her interview. Number one, she shared details on the conflict between Dan and Wendy that I personally hadn't heard anywhere else. Number two, some of her comments shed light on what I feel is Wendy's MO of demonizing, gaining allies, and then using those allies for different purposes. Number three, it is crazy how closely Tamara's intuition about Wendy, the family, and the odd timing of things so closely aligns with Jeffrey Lacasse's intuition about the same things. Number four, the information she shared about Wendy's ability to plan long-term and in secret and then suddenly and shockingly execute is eerie when we think about how the murder of Dan Markell played out. What are your takeaways? And what parts of Tamara's interview do you think could be used as evidence or to support or create context around evidence in a trial? Leave your thoughts in the comments.
Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a like, subscribe to the channel, and trust your intuition. See you in the next one.